My name is Dexter Gordon. I serve as Executive Vice President here at the Evergreen State College with campuses in Olympia and Tacoma. It is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you to this special program hosted by Evergreen under the title Advancing Equity, Racial Justice and Resilience, Washington's Women of Color Legislatures. And it is in that mode that I extend special welcome to our Women of Color Legislatures who will be our panelists today. I will leave it to the wonderful moderators, Deans Coley Gladney and Marsha Tate Arunga to introduce our panel and introduce our program more fully. My responsibility is to welcome you as the audience who have joined us today. We so appreciate you uh, taking the time in the middle of your Monday to join us for this that we believe is a very special program. This is a time where we're invited to pay attention to the work of women of color and particularly the outstanding women of color in our state legislators, uh, who are state legislators. And before we move into this dynamic program, I want to remind us that the Evergreen State College is located on the ceded territories of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which include the Squaxin Island Tribe, the Nisqually Indian Tribe, and the Puyallup Tribe of Indians. The Olympia area was historically a center for trade and exchange among many Salish Sea tribes, including the Chehalis and the Skokomish and others. With this awareness, we honor the ancestors and pay respect to elders past and present of the Medicine Creek Treaty tribes and to all native people of this land. It's important for us to note that not only do we do a land acknowledgement, but we acknowledge the debt we owe to native people and the responsibility we have to partner with them in making sure that we are part of a sustainable planet and particularly a sustainable region of this nation. Thank you for the shared awareness of the importance of our work among native people. And I hope our continued work will be informed by this understanding. And now, I hand over to our uh, two deans who moderate today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. Appreciate that. I am Coley Gladney. I serve as the Dean of Inclusive Excellence and Student Success, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm joined by my wonderful co-moderator, Dr. Marsha Tate Arunga, Dean of the Tacoma Program. Good afternoon, Coley. Good to be here with you and to co-moderate this special occasion. It's such an honor. Thank you. So I'd like to also extend welcome to our students, staff, faculty, and panelists, and a special warm welcome to our first year students coming from the Greener Foundation programs and our Tacoma campus students and colleagues. Thank you so much for being here. So back in 2018, as part of our equity symposium programming, we hosted the first Women of Color Legislators panel, which included all of the legislators who you're gonna meet uh, here today. And I was reflecting on that first panel and um, remembering how informative and inspiring that panel was. Um, and how much I appreciated hearing the panelists' personal stories about what inspired them to become legislators and thinking someone here today who's hearing this is going to run for office. It was so inspiring. 
Um, and they also talked about what keeps them going and focused on serving their communities through their legislative roles. Well, a lot has happened since that first in-person panel, the election of 2020 and its long drawn out aftermath, the global pandemic, which is still with us, and the racial justice and climate justice movements have gained momentum and visibility in a way that many of us have not seen before. So it's my pleasure to welcome back these powerful women legislators and engage with them as we consider the themes of advancing equity, racial justice, and resilience, which are so, um, they're with us today, um, these themes. And so we, we look forward to engaging with our panelists. Um, we have, to let you know our format, my co-moderator and I will, will pose our questions to the panelists in about three rounds. And then we'll be choosing a few questions from the Q&A at the end. So please do think about your questions and, and put those in the Q&A. So I wanna start by just asking each panelist to introduce yourself um, and tell us the reason that you initially decided to run for office. And if we have time, I have a follow-up question, but let's start there. You wanna choose someone? Absolutely. Let's start. Who I see um, on my screen is uh, Milan Tai, Representative Tai. Well, thank, thank you, Chloe. I was about to say, um, if you don't pick us, we are very polite. <laughs> and we love each other so much. It's sort of like, um, I dare to say, um, we get to speak for each other sometimes, not all the times, but um, we have the tendency to really lift and support one another as um, women of color in the state legislature. So um, thank you, first of all, for honoring me um, uh, to invite me back to this wonderful um, platform so that I have the opportunity to really speak to the audience whom um, very, very close to my heart. Uh, first of all, my name is Mi Lin Tai. I'm the state representative representing legislative district 41, which um, is east of Lake Washington, um, including the city of Moose Island, uh, half of Bellevue, the city of Newcastle, a little bit of Brenton, a little bit of Issaquah, and a little bit of Sammamish. And I say that deliberately because, as we all know, redistricting is happening. Um, so pay attention to that. It's, it matters. It's important as much as your representation. Um, the question asked is um, why I myself decided to uh, run and serve in this space. Um, I am the first refugee uh, being elected to serve in Washington State Legislature. Uh, my family, um, thank you, Marsha. My family came to, to Washington in 1983 uh, as refugee from Vietnam. Um, and um, I, will, I will be the first to say that um, uh, I did not have a dream to grow up and be a politician. Um, as a refugees, and, um, uh, and many of you know refugee immigrants, um, or maybe some of you have the privilege, and I call it the privilege, because for me, um, I, it's afford me, number one, the reason why I ran and so. Uh, number two, it's afford me a chance to really build up the capacity of understanding and, um, and, and honestly shopping, shopping the, the definitions of equity in my mind, being in my positions, which is the privilege to meet those who are being deemed undocumented, living among us, absolutely talented, absolutely amazing, um, and honor to call um, than my neighbors, my brother and sisters. Serve in the positions as the first refugee in Washington state legislature has been quite a journey. Um, I have finished my first term. This would be halfway through my second term. 
translated into three years in Olympia. Uh, I learned so much, especially from somebody who historically wouldn't have a seat at the table. Um, I learned about the system and I, I, in order to really being able to, um, to represent uh, that particular uh, populations, I don't have a choice but learn really quickly. And when doors are not open for me, I learn to use my karate chop and kick that door open um, and force myself in the space. Um, in order to know what system it is and participate in the conversation. And so um, I say that really highlight the answer of why I run and serve. Um, because as many of us, we want to be heard, we want to participate, and we want to help collaborate so that our state and the people who live in our state um, get the services they need it. Thank you for this opportunity again. Thank you so much. Um, and I love that you led with, we are supportive of each other and we'll wait <laughs> until someone else has a chance to speak. Um, the second part of that question that I was gonna ask you really um, sort of spoke to, which was, how do you encourage those who haven't been politically involved or have not felt welcome in political environments or haven't had a seat at the table to find a way into community work and civic engagement and to make an impact? So thank you for going there. And I would invite um, Senator Emily Randall, who I see on my screen to, to go ahead and, and, and introduce yourself and, and answer the question of why also, why did you run? Thank you, Coley. I am just so overjoyed to get to spend this time with um, you all today and with my my sisters in the legislature and was also just reflecting on how joyful it was to be together for that first panel and to sit side by side in that crowded auditorium um, with students who are so eager to go on their own leadership journeys. And I look forward to the time when we can do that safely again. Um, but for now, how special to be able to share this day together. Um, I am Senator Emily Randall, and I'm also in my third year. I think that's true for all of us. Um, and for me, that means three quarters of the way through my first term. Sorry, Senate terms are a little bit longer. And I ran in 2018 in the community that I grew up in, um, but where I had lived away for a while. I left Washington to go to college, um, and I went to a liberal arts college on the East Coast. I went to Wellesley because at the time when I graduated, uh, because of my family's um, socioeconomic situation, it was cheaper for me to go to a school so far away that um, had a commitment to meet my full need than it was to stay in state. And I'm happy to say that since then, we've been able to pass really incredible transformative financial aid policy. That means that if I were making that decision today, it would be a different, um, there would be different options for me, but I, you know, I left and I thought I might never come back. You know, I might leave this small town in the house that my mom grew up in, in the county where my dad grew up to um, and spread my wings. And who knows what that big world has out there in store for me. I didn't think it was politics necessarily. I thought it was, you know, I wanted to be of service. I wanted to give back to a system that had given so much to my family. I learned really early on as a young girl what it meant though to have uh, a safety net because when my sister Olivia was born with pretty severe developmental disabilities um, when I was seven she initially didn't qualify for Medicaid but that same year Washington's legislature expanded uh, Medicaid coverage and meant that and that meant that Olivia could get all of the care that she needed and it was you know that story and my financial aid story that led me to explore what I might do with my life whether it was um, you know, working in nonprofit, I worked as a fundraiser for um, my alma mater, um, ensuring that other students had access to the same financial aid. I worked at a children's hospital 
which was uh, the regional safety net hospital so that kids like my sister or with other complex health needs could get the care they needed no matter what, no matter what their coverage was like. I worked for an HIV organization and for uh, Planned Parenthood uh, Federation of America to ensure that other queer Americans like me and our neighbors and our communities had access to the comprehensive health care and um, not just comprehensive, but, but culturally competent and safe that saw us for who we are. So ensured that, that other folks had access to that kind of care. And then, and then the 2016 election happened and it was on election night when I worried about whether or not I would ever be able to raise enough private funds to continue expanding healthcare the way our communities needed it. Whether the legislators who represented my home district would be willing to fight for that kind of expansion. And I didn't see that in them. I didn't see um, people in the positions of power in my community who were going to advocate for the healthcare needs, for the education needs, for the safety net that families like mine had benefited from. And so that's why I ran. And in Olympia, I'm, it's a great honor to be the first and currently only out queer member of the Senate, the youngest member of the Senate and the first woman of color to represent my district and to be able to chair the higher education committee so that students who come before our committee can see themselves holding my gavel so that they can imagine what kind of uh, positions of power are available. And I always wear big hoops when I chair committee. I usually also wear my HEFA nameplate necklace because for me, it's important to not only bring their voices with me to make sure that students are in the room, to make sure that folks impacted by policies are in the room, but also to model what it can look like to have a different kind of leadership that doesn't wear the same black or blue suit and have a tie and tight haircut. No shade to my friends who <laughs> rock that look, but um, you know, there is room for more of us and that's what drives me. Oh, thank you so much, Senator Randall. Keeping it real. <laughs> I love that with your hoops. <laughs> Um, it just occurs to me how much, um, you know, your story speaks to just a history of service in your family and, um, and for students listening and maybe thinking about, you know, what would prepare me for um, running for office? It's a real big, broad variety of experiences. So thank you for also speaking to that. Um, so I'd like to call on Senator Das. See you there. Would you please introduce yourself? and why you ran for office. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Um, as me Lynn mentioned, Representative Ty, we, you know, the first time we did this panel, I think it was right after our first year and we were all started at the same time. It was so great to be in a room full of supportive people and to be with each other. You know, we'd never really been on a panel together. And, um, you know, it was, I'm here with my seatmate, Rep Entman, who is, will be introducing herself next. So it's just really wonderful to see and be with you all and to be with each other and to be in the space that's supportive because we do have unique challenges. We do have different challenges. We are treated differently. We come to the rooms differently. We have, you know, different lived experiences and it's so important uh, to be in community and to be in spaces that we are supported and um, like as, as Senator Randall mentioned, to give back. You know, this is one of the ways in which I give back. I love being called in to speak with uh, rooms full of uh, communities of color and women. Um, and as Senator Randall mentioned, to be that vision of diversity and to be that vision of you know, leadership that something that other folks can inspire to, because I'll tell you what, we didn't work this hard to get this far to only go this far. And when we do leave our seats someday, we don't, we want you, the people on this call to be taking our spots. So we're keeping them warm for you. So we really hope that you come behind us. And so as mentioned, I'm Mona Das. I'm the Senator from the 47th district, which is including 
um, Kent, which there's 148 languages spoken in the Kent School District. So there's a very, very diverse community. Um, parts of Auburn, Covington, a little bit of Renton and a little bit of Black Diamond. So we'll see what happens. As someone mentioned earlier, um, by November 15th, we'll have new district lines. So we'll be representing um, you know, different parts of the community potentially. So stay tuned for that and, and get engaged in that because this is the next 10 years of what uh, district looks like. And I'll tell you, this, this makes a huge difference. This has allowed folks like the four of us that are on this call to be in positions where we can get elected because there were communities um, support. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about why I ran and what inspired me. I am, uh, I think I do my best thinking in the shower. I don't know about you. And about 15 years ago, I, I was visiting my brother and I got out of the shower and I said, I'm going to be a Senator. And we both just laughed because like, I'm very classically Indian. Like half my family are doctors, the other half are engineers. And we just laughed because it was just like the most preposterous thing I could have possibly said, but I don't know, it came to me. And so years go by and this is one of those ideas like I put on the shelf, right? And you take a look, you know, every once in a while, I'd bring it down and dust it off and laugh again and put it back on the shelf. And then, you know, years go by and I'm walking my dog who actually had more energy than I did and he doesn't like to stop. And so we're walking and I see a sign. I literally saw a sign and it said, Pramila Jayapal for state Senate. And I'll never forget that moment. I stopped, my dog is pulling and barking and carrying on wanting to keep moving and I stopped. And I, for the first time, saw three things. I saw a name that I knew clearly was Indian. I saw a name that I clearly knew was a woman and it actually said state Senate. And I just stood in front of that sign everyone for at least five minutes. And I just cried my eyes out because it was the first time that I saw my dream was possible. And that is why I ran because I believe representation truly matters. And I can tell you the legislature with Rep Entman, Senator Randall, Rep Ty and I, and, and many of the others that got elected the year we ran is a completely different place. And we know that to be true because all the lobbyists tell us that almost every time I have a meeting with them is like, wow, the Senate has changed. Those, uh, the House has changed. Things are different. Things are moving faster and equity is um, first and foremost on so many people's minds. And that is truly because we now have representation. This is the most diverse legislature we have literally ever had in the history of the legislature. And if you ever get the opportunity to come to Olympia, you can walk down the hallway and see the difference. You can see all the legislators that came before us. And I will tell you, they don't look like any of the four of us on this call today. And so that to me is why I ran. That's why I keep um, you know, showing up to events like this because I want to make sure um, voices are heard, you know, people can see legislators that reflect their values and look like them and sound like them and have backgrounds that like them. And um, it truly is so important to me um, that representation matters. And so I'm really honored to be here. Once again, I'm so grateful for Evergreen to continually put this panel on because I think it's really important. And judging by the attendance today, this is a huge turnout. It's so great to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Senator Das. Um, thinking about how that sign was a sign for you, <laughs> an actual sign, and um, your your point that representation does matter, and that's a theme that I'm already hearing. So, this time I'd like to invite um, Representative Entenman to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I appreciate the Evergreen family inviting me to return to be on this panel. It is an honor to serve with my colleagues and to be here with the Evergreen family. I am Deborah Entenman, representative from the 47th District, Kent, Covington, and Auburn. And I, um, I am in the legislature because I think 
more than anything, the person who had this seat prior to me didn't represent my values. And when he was on the house floor talking about breakfast after the bell, which was a legislative effort to provide breakfast to every student in a school, if 60% of the students in that building um, qualified for free or reduced price lunch, there is a uh, Department of Ag program that allows for everyone in the school to be served breakfast after the bill so students don't have to come early. And on the House floor, his speech included statements that were, children are obese and they waste food. Parents have a responsibility to send their children to school with breakfast. And if teachers really wanna feed hungry kids, they can take food out of the trash that other children have thrown away and feed it to those children. And if they're really hungry, they will consume that food. And I thought to myself, that person does not represent my thoughts, my ideas. There's just no way I would want anyone who represents the community that I vote in, that I live in, and that I pay my property taxes in should be in the legislature saying that children should be fed from the trash can because they are poor. And I think that hit me in, as we would say, some kind of way because I grew up in Seattle in the Rainer Vista Housing Project. I was in the very first class of Seattle King County Head Start. And as a student through elementary school, I benefited from some of those programs that would provide free or reduced price lunch for students. I know that every time I went to get lunch, I was happy to have it. And there were days when I brought um, lunch home from home, but there were also days that I knew that there was nothing at home for me to pack to make a lunch. And I always wanted to make sure that there would never be another legislator in a community that I represented that could think so little of children, especially hungry children. So that is why I ran. When I think about what I hope to encourage the next generation to do, I think we want you to run because you see things in a different perspective than I do. There are changes that I can't even see coming that you are preparing yourselves for now as you are maneuvering this road of higher education. And we use this language of marginalized people or low-income people or poor people. And really what I think it is is we are many things, but what we are mostly is we are people who folks who were in leadership did not think deserved to be thought of when we were making legislation and deserved to be thought of when we were thinking about leadership. So, you know, I think of us as a missed opportunity for success in this country. I see people who are left out as a resource. And so I want to make sure that I encourage those folks who others may have said don't have a voice to use your voice. It is, it is vitally important. You come with their perspective. You yourself are the resource and you can make change in our society. Thank you so much. I appreciate that reframe about folks who have historically not been involved and the reasons why, and the reasons why it's more, even more important for folks to get involved. Thank you so much. And I wanna invite Dr. Tate Arunga to take this next round of questions. Yes, how amazing so far, Coley. We are so fortunate to have such an amazing panelist, but even more so people who are representing us. You represent us. I really get that sincerity here today. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I think I'd like to start with Representative Intamin, not because I know you <laughs> and grew up with you and have dear love for you, your family. I even know your grandmother, your mother, everybody. 
but I, um, I would like to just switch it up a little bit. I want to know, with more women of color being elected in the last two election cycles, there's been a wonderful and meaningful sea change in terms of the types of bills that are being introduced and passed into law. And in your years of office, each of you have played a role in advancing equity and racial justice in Washington state. And I just wanna say thank you for that. Well done. You remind me of the quad. We in Washington state have our own quad. Oh, how awesome is that? Now, what I wanna know, please tell us about a piece of legislation and your uh, that you are particularly proud of supporting and the challenges you faced and how you've moved that vision forward. So I'm going to start with Representative Entman, and I want to ask that question of all of our panelists. Well, first of all, um, I am willing to admit that my legislation, any piece of legislation that I work on is a team effort. I have great staff. I have great colleagues. I have people who have come to the legislature before me, and I have grassroots organizations that are supporting what I do. I think the piece of legislation that I am most proud of is um, something that doesn't always get talked about a lot. You know, I was I I um, I had the opportunity to sponsor one of our uh, a significant bill on pri on internet privacy. But the piece of legislation that I'm most proud of is a piece of legislation that piloted a program that allowed hungry students on college campuses to have access to food. We know that many of our students who are on college campuses make a decision about paying for tuition and materials as opposed to having something to eat. And so, there was a bill that I sponsored that passed the legislature and has now been expanded um, that would allow students who would qualify for food benefits through um, temporary aid for needy families will be able to use some of those benefits, use their EBT card on college campuses. So we are now working with the Department of Ad to have that come to fruition. I think that it is an honorable thing for students who can't afford a meal program to donate food to students who can't. I believe that it is honorable that almost all of our colleges, whether two year or four year, have food pantries for students to access food so that they can take it home. I also think that it is important for college life that as a student, a simple, simple thing like going into the cafeteria, the student union, whatever y'all are calling it now, and be able to slide your little card and buy some food or get food out of a vending machine, just like everyone else. I also want people to remember as we encourage students to do Running Start, many of those students were low income and they do running start on their high school campuses where they can still have access to food, but they come to the college campuses and there's no free and reduced price lunch on the college campus. So we have to think about who our students are, not this image of who our students are, but think about the reality of who our students are and meet them where they are. So providing wraparound services emergency services and access to food on campus is one of the things I'm most proud of because I think that that really shows that we care about our students. That's awesome, thank you. I think what's so awesome about that is your consistency. You talked about being inspired of going to politics because of the way that you saw food uh, reduced in uh, free lunch. And now in the college level, you're seeing that. And I so fully agree with you that we all deserve to have good and healthy food. That's how we learn. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's hear from Representative um, Das, Senator Das, excuse me. I love it when Deborah Rep. Entman tells those stories because they're so important and so impactful for so many students beyond. So thank you, Rep. Entman, for all your hard work there. 
Um, I want to talk about one bill extremely briefly, and then I'll talk about another one more in depth. So one of the bills I'm most proud of is, is very public as of October 1st. If you've gone to the grocery store anytime between now and the beginning of October, you'll see that we have banned plastic bags in the state of Washington. And if you do choose to bring your own bag, that's the whole point. We want you to bring your own bags. But if you don't, uh, it will cost you eight cents for a bag. And the whole point is to modify and hopefully uh, promote behavior that is literally, you know, bring your own bag. That's what we want you to do. So that is a bill that I'm extremely proud of um, that's in effect October 1st. So that's really exciting for me. I went to the grocery store the other day and I have to say I got I got teary eyed at the, at the cash register. Um, seeing something like that be implemented statewide was really great. Um, but the other bill I want to talk about is uh, extremely near and dear to my heart. Um, as, as you may know, I'm an immigrant. My family came here um, from India when I was eight months old with six dollars and English was not my first language when I went to school. So I had um, some language barriers and my parents thought I was really smart and they um, get, got me tested for the gifted program. Well, I didn't pass. And of course my parents just, I think assumed that that meant I wasn't smart. And years later, fast forward, I just turned 50 last week or last month. So years later, fast forward and you realize that those tests are biased, right? They have all kinds of cultural competency issues and you know, having English not being my first language was definitely um, a hindrance to me. So this bill, uh, Senate Bill 5044, um, was to add DEI and anti-racism training to K through 12 educators and professional administrators. And, you know, we worked really hard with um, the uh, Washington Education Association with many teachers, a lot of students that came and shared their personal stories. And, you know, somewhere in there, um, it was sort of labeled the critical critical race theory bill, um, which well, that wasn't the intent. Um, you know, really for me, it was through my own experience, what I experienced as a child, not wanting any child to have to um, go through that or any parents to go through that. And so that's really kind of where the bill became personal for me. Um, you know, it did get signed into law and now there's, you know, <laughs> school board races across the country or school board, um, they're having to talk about critical race theory. I actually had an interview with the Huffington Post a few months ago and they told me that this is the first quote unquote critical race theory bill that's passed um, in the country. And while it wasn't a critical race theory bill, it was uh, really about making sure students and teachers you know, understood uh, the different barriers for um, kids that come from immigrant families um, or kids that have um, different learning methods at home. That, that's really what the bill was about. And I'm really proud of it. Um, I wanna thank my house colleagues here as well. Um, we all made this your last bill um, at, the, at the end of session and Almost everyone um, from the Senate Democrats spoke about this bill and the impact that it had on either themselves or their communities. And that was really, really beautiful and touching to watch. And um, I'm really proud of the bill, especially being here with Evergreen. And um, yeah, well, that's to me, I think, you know, really highlights why representation matters because until you have an experience like that, and I, I mean, I know it wasn't just me, right? So many. We've heard so many stories about the need for um, teachers and administrators to understand what different communities bring to the table and the value that that is that diversity. Um, it was really um, it was a it was a great bill and I'm really proud of it. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we're proud of you for advancing such a bold legislation. It sounds like behavior change is one of your big themes because you got us in the grocery store remembering to bring our own bags. And now you have uh, also got us thinking about diversity and equity in very serious structural ways. So thank you for that. Good work. 
Okay, let's hear from uh, now from Representative Randall. Hello. Well, what um, how what an incredible chance to kind of reflect on some of the big policy that this group of amazing humans um, worked on over the past couple of sessions. I was thinking about you know what what is it that was most meaningful and impactful to me and 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 what process also um, made a was a change because you know I think. My first year, and this might be true for some of us, you get thrown into the policy writing process and like colleagues hand you policies that they've worked on. And, you know, there, there's sort of a, a formula for how you do it. The certain group of stakeholders that you engage with that has kind of looked the same maybe for a while and that is based on, you know, who our communities are. And so one of the biggest impacts for me, especially as, you know, this group and our growing members of Color Caucus are increasingly diverse legislature continues to get more and more diverse is that the process even begins to look different. Who we reach out to, where our ideas come from, how they get passed through the process is new and exciting and continuing to change and influenced by community like all of you, like these uh, the students who are tuning in, the faculty who are engaged, educators and neighbors who whose voices are just as important as our individual voices. Um, and one bill that really reflects that process to me is 5227, which is similar to Senator Doss's 5044 bill in that it focuses on equity and anti-racism education. Um, but the idea came about um, when I was invited to um, a faculty and staff of color conference for the CTC system in Washington. And I was invited by a friend of mine who um, is uh, a, or was a faculty member at Olympic College. And she said, we were just out for drinks. And she said, oh, you should come to this. It's going to be in Spokane. I went and I sat in sessions listening to incredible educators talk about how they support students of color and how they support each other and show up for each other in the within a system that is challenging and wasn't necessarily built with them in mind. And, you know, they were, I was in a, a session where some educators were talking about, you know, how, what they needed in order to feel more supported. And one of the things was more colleagues who looked like them and colleagues who didn't look like them, who understood, better understood the challenges that students of color were facing, that low-income students were facing, so that it wasn't just the faculty of color who were taking on the work of making their campuses more equitable. And so I raised my hand and I asked if we, if training might help, if mandatory training for their colleagues might be a way that we could make some progress, not a complete fix to the system. We know that there's more work to do, but would that be a start? And folks got excited. And as I started talking to students and um, you know folks from other institutions, I talked to counselors and um, DEI leaders. We had a bunch of shared brainstorming sessions where we pulled out like a Google whiteboard um, to enter ideas and put up sticky notes and talk about what's working and what isn't and where we need to go. Um, students asked to be included too. And we started building um, a more robust framework for requiring equity and anti-racism education on our college campuses that included everyone. And it was like Senator Doss's bill, a struggle. You know, we, we um, you know, it, it very quickly an education tool became politicized and we had some of the tensest of Senate floor fights in my memory um, over you know some of this legislation and and that to me tells me that it's just that important when when the opposition is willing to um, really make up their own version of the truth about what is happening on our campuses, that tells me that the work really, really, really needs to happen. And what I feel so proud is that 
you know, this work included the voices of students and faculty and educators and administrators and our community members and was a strong piece of policy, but also a really strong process. And that is super exciting to me. Wow. When the opposition makes the versions of, uh, yes, of the truth, their version of the truth. Thank you for that. So powerful. So glad you're in edu higher education. Now we know who to go to. All right. And then um, last but not least, there's somebody I'm missing. It would be me. Oh, ah, Melin. <laughs> yes, how can I miss you? Let's hear your powerful presentation. What is your favorite? What is the most powerful legislation you have been a part of? Thank you, Dean, if you don't mind me calling you by your first name, because I absolutely, I don't know if we met in person, but I'm just kind of like in love with you right now. So, <laughs> And I with you, it's true. Women I feel are, like this is like, movement. <laughs> this is our sister talking. Um, I love everything my sisters has been sharing and um, I don't know the bill that I'm very proud to support and get to vote on uh, on my first year um, was Keep Washington Working. Um, unfortunately, the impl implementation of that legislation has been slow. So um, I've been paying very close attention to how that legislation being implemented, um, even though as um, uh, um, Dean Gladney mentioned um, the election of 2020 has passed. Um, at the same time, it doesn't mean it's any easier for people like us. Uh, that's the reality. The bill that I am sharing with uh, students and, 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 and the family um, today is um, court open to all. I'm so proud of that bill. Uh, first of all, because I'm not a lawyer. Second of all, because I'm not a judge. Third of all, because I met so many people whose constitutional right was being violated at its core, who personal safety was being violated at its core. And the very belief in freedom, liberty, and justice, that's as a refugee, my parents uprooted all of us to come here and to seek to build our life was challenged. So court open to all, um, when I worked on that bill, it was quite an opportunity for me to also learn what we learned in school is that our, our government structure is so amazing. We have three branches of government of equal power and we are check and balance and we is like perfect that the rest of the world need to look at us and learn from us. I'm here to tell you that's not true. And that's what I learned. And so old folks like me depend on you, um, amazing young leaders in the near future, far future, that if that is what we believe in check and balance, there's a lot of work for us to do. Because the very, I, I remember talking to the court representative who opposed the bill. Um, was like, I get it, I get it. I mean, no, of course, you know, the tradition, judiciary, the judicial branch do not want um, the legislative branch to tell them to tell you what to do, um, because certainly that's your lane, and we shouldn't cross over. But isn't that amazing that legislative branch? and judicial brain agree that the court should be safe for everyone who comes to be heard 
and seek justice. So you keep saying that you can fix it internally while the people are being arrested and detained. So this is where check and balance coming in. This is when legislative branch need to do something to help you do what you want to do. So should we celebrate instead of debate? Um, to me, that was quite a learning experience. Very happy to, to, to have that, that legislation passed um, on, on, on first try, introduce it, passed. Um, but then the pandemic happened. We haven't really seen how it is being implemented yet. Um, I continue to, to lead on that work and continue to communicate with our court system so that the intent of the bill is to ensure the courthouse literally open for all so that people can be heard and seek justice. Thank you so much for that. You are so right. Checks and balances. We have to pay attention. We are going to have to listen much more carefully, aren't we? So thank you so much for, for your contributions. Back over to you, Dean Coley. Thank you, Dr. Tate Arunga. And thank you, everyone. It was It's just really impactful to hear not only about the legislation you're proud of, but to you let us in on part of the process of, of, of what happens with a bill. And that's really valuable to many of us who I think are, have maybe not been so involved, you know, who vote, but then we're like, what happens, <laughs> you know? So thank you so much. Um, and I do want to um, give extra special thanks to Senator Randall for her work on uh, the bill 5227, which is gonna be hugely impactful for Evergreen. Um, and I know you have to leave us pretty soon to, to, to go to the rest of your um, commitments, um, but thank you for, for joining us. So for this next round, um, we wanna really spotlight kind of one of our student questions we engaged with um, some of the students from Greener Foundations to get kind of their questions. Um, and, and this one is a, a bit of two, maybe three-parter, <laughs> so I'll, I'll read slowly. Um, you know, going through college, I was a first-generation college student. We serve a high number of first-generation college students. We have a lot of, um, there are a lot of barriers for a lot of students. We also know that students bring with them a lot of strengths and resilience. Um, we wanna ask you now, um, if you can think back, what challenges and um, inspirations did you experience in your education? Um, and how have these experiences kind of given you strength, hope, and resilience to engage in the work of advancing equity and racial justice? Um, and that's not all. <laughs> if you can just speak to um, a message, I've been hearing these messages throughout um, what you've been saying to students. If you could encapsulate that and um, just in this time of turbulence, um, and opportunity also. Um, can, you, can you give us kind of your, a message that you'd um, like students to hear from you? So challenges, inspirations from your education, um, and then a message to our students um, to help them with their resilience and to keep going. And I'm gonna, I wanna open this up to whoever feels really inspired to get in there, um, feel free. Well, should I, since I just finished, I jump in and, and um, to follow Marsha uh, <laughs> kind of orders. <laughs> I think to answer that question, um, and, and hopefully you see this in the theme as far as how, how I engage in conversations, we, we, about, we all about telling our stories. Um, Because each of us, each of us one way or another, uh, in the very end to me, is being human. And being human meaning 
we impacted by emotions and by um, events that e either we witness or we participated in, experienced in. So I came here in 83, I was a, uh, I entered public school in federal way um, as a 10th grader. When I say we, we are not just a title, not just, um, shouldn't be seen as, as, as one moment in time, but we are everything sort of the, the closest thing I've heard was from my, my colleague representative Lakenov to my culture is that we are the, the embodiment of several generations after us and several generations before us. And all of those amazing force of nature build us to who we are. And so I guess this is to the very last questions is that you, I am amazing. You are powerful because you are not just this. You are so much more. And that is still to me limited to sort of that immediate family. To me, I believe that we connected beyond our genetic factor. We are truly one of humanity, cross-border. And because of that, you, I am powerful. English was not my first, uh, my second language. French was my second language. I spoke, I spoke fluently French and of course my home language, Vietnam, Vietnamese. If anybody who, who knows me knows and Rep Entiment and, and Senator Das would know, uh, if you let me have room and air to talk, I don't know how to stop because there's so much to share. But being that teenager in a high school, for the first time, I felt deaf and muted. I felt very much a um, individual who completely out of what, what I believe uh, or an image of me. Um, the next year being a junior, my counselor asked me, well, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go for school? What do you want to be? And um, through the interpretation of my French teacher, I owe a debt to her because at the time um, in early 80s, there was no, there's no requirement of having an interpreter. You figure it out, right? Um, I told my counselor I wanted to become a doctor without even finding out why I wanted to become a doctor. My counselor told me that um, that is definitely not something you can be. It's just not. Um, choose something else. And, uh, and this, is, this was where my personality sort of showed through. I asked my counselor to write down what I need to do so that I can be a doctor. And she wrote down this list. In that next two year, I finished pretty much everything on that list as far as the requirement. Um, graduated with honor in my high school. And I learned, so here's a system. And I learned that when I passed the TOEFL test with a high, high uh, score, with a high GPA, when I get to University of Washington, despite English was still not the best, like I couldn't really communicate very well. Um, I can study like a bookworm, but that's about it. Um, I was not qualified for any assistant at all because of my grade point average, right? Um, well, anybody who read my bio on my uh, page, I'm not a doctor. I graduated as a pharmacist because I knew that if I 
would take the MCAT required to apply to medical school and if I didn't pass as a refugee, I cannot help my family. Um, and that was not an option. Failing was not an option. But here's the weird thing. After I earned my degree in pharmacy, I think I was at 22 years old, I think. Time, time passed. Um, I asked myself, what do you do after now you have a degree, you have a choice of going out there and be a pharmacist and making, I think at the time about $50 an hour, which was like really, really sick. I think that's the language I learned from my children. Like when you say something really sick, it's like, woo, that's cool. Uh, but I have that crisis, that personal crisis. I was like, no, the reason why I wanted to become a doctor was, was not because I'm being Asian and become either a doctor, an engineer or a lawyer. No, it was because I was raised by my grandparents in this very tiny province in Vietnam. That little province did not have any clinic. When my grandmother was ill, she was taken away somewhere. About a month or so later, she came home. And I heard from my aunt and uncle how wonderful the doctors were taking care of my grandma. So at that time, I wanted to become a doctor to take care of all grandparents so no kids have ever had to miss them. That was why I wanted to become a doctor. So I question myself now being a pharmacist. I went back and served as a volunteer interpreter at the refugee clinic. All refugees who enter our state have to be screened. And I remember when my family came through that screening, we were very fearful. We didn't understand the language was one. Secondly, we didn't understand what those drugs would do to us. And if anybody who having to take drug for tuberculosis, at the time, it was a long, long, long time with large, large dose. So I decided to use my knowledge to help ease the fear of those who already experienced so much trauma coming into this country and believe that we're here for a second chance. So I'm coming back to the question. We are greater. You are greater than what you believe or what you can see in the mirror. You are amazing individuals and use your time so that you can achieve something much more, much more than you. Thank you so much for sharing those stories and how your experiences informed how you go on to serve others. It's so inspiring. And just this message of that we're more than just ourselves, that we are a collection of these generations that come before and after us. Thank you so much for that, taking that with me. Um, Again, the question is about challenges that you might have faced um, when you were going through your schooling um, and what kind of a message you want to pass along to our students in these kind of times of turmoil, but also I you know, would be remiss if I didn't recognize that um, they're opportunistic based on what you all have shared with us about the changes that you've been able to make. So I invite you, um, if you're feeling inspired to tell us a challenge and how you faced it and what you would pass along to our students. So I am, uh, on my next birthday, I will be 60 years old. I did not start college until I was 38, almost 40. I wanted to, I wanted to fulfill a promise that I had made to my mother when I originally started college in the 80s, I met my husband and left school, got married, had two kids. 
when my children decided that they were going to do running start, I um, said, oh, that sounds like fun. I'll go to the community college. We did not go at the same time. Don't worry. I wasn't that much of a helicopter parent. But I did decide to return to college when my student, when my students were in, my children were in college. And I did two years of undergrad at Highline Community College. And then I applied for Seattle University and received a scholarship for non-traditional students. I didn't know at that time what a non-traditional student was. I thought it was just somebody who was old. Cause you know, um, I, I was in class with students who were the age of my children, but really it was for students who were coming back into the educational sphere after more than 10 years and less than 20 years is how they defined it at Seattle University. It was not easy for me to transition to a college setting because I was still working and raising a family, married, and I still had my academic obligations that I needed to fulfill. I also am part of what they call the sandwich generation where I was caring for aging parents. My mother and my grandmother raised me and I, um, I felt that I had an obligation to help take care of them as they were aging. When I was in school, my grandmother was alive and she was a hundred years old. And um, taking care of her was a priority for me. And I was going to leave school because she had gotten ill and she needed to have care. What I found out was there was a nursing home on the campus of Seattle U. And uh, Father Sumbert has said that if there was a bed available, she could have it. Um, I did not know how we were going to pay for that. He said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. You are a good student and I want you to be here. And if having your grandmother and Bessie Burton Sullivan will allow you to stay on campus, then I want you to be on campus. So this, what I thought was going to be a hardship became a challenge. It was still a challenge, but it did not mean that I needed to leave school, but it benefited both my relationship with my grandmother and my grandmother's relationship with the world because she moved from being in her own apartment where she knew where everything was to being on campus at Seattle University. This allowed her to have access to nursing students and this allowed her to have access to history students and this allowed students to have access to a 100 year old person. And so I would bring her to the student center and literally people would just talk to a 100 year old lady. Um, it, was, it was really an amazing experience. It was an amazing experience for me. But what it taught me was sometimes you step out on faith. We used to sing this song when I was growing up is that we've come this far by faith. I did not know how I was going to take care of my family and take care of my grandmother and still be a full-time college student. I was able to do more things than I thought possible. You are able to do more things than you believe are possible because you have to. You have the strength, you have the perseverance, you can do them. Don't compare yourselves to other people. And along the way, don't forget to ask for help because I did not know that Seattle U had a nursing home on campus. And I was only going to leave. And when the Dean of Students said, I want you to talk to Father Sunberg before you go because you're a scholarship student and you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to explain myself. And I, I wasn't, you know, like I'm an adult. I don't wanna go talk to Father Sunberg. I don't wanna go talk to the president of the college about why I'm leaving. I, I just need to take care of my family. I just need to go. And I never knew that I would have an opportunity to do something different and still have access to my, to education um, because I needed some help. I got the help and I, and I was still able to do that. So I would say, do not give up. And sometimes you need to ask for help and there are people who are available to help you. Oh, thank you for that story. Just imagining that all of these college students had access to someone who had all this wisdom and then that your grandmother had access to all of these other folks. It's just the community that was created. That's beautiful. 
Um, thank you for sharing that. And just the idea that you are able to do more than you think is possible. Wow, that is a little bit of a leap of faith. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, I think I'm turning to um, Representative Das, Senator Das, excuse me, <laughs> for um, you know reflecting on your education and maybe closing us out of this round with some um, words for students. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I, two really big lessons for me, um, and I'll share stories about either, um, both of them. The first is you have to believe in yourself. And the second is to keep going. So there is a, um, a saying that a woman needs to be asked seven times to run um, for office before she'll think about it. And for a woman of color, they say it's 10. So that that is 10 times that someone has to suggest or ask them to run before they'll even think about it. And this is, I always share the story, you know, my pop quiz is how many times do you think I was asked? And, you know, I wait for a while and people throw out different numbers and, and the number is zero. Nobody looked at me and my credentials and my abilities and my skills and ever even considered that I could make a difference in my community in this way. And so that is why you have to believe in yourself because I believed in myself and I believed that I could do it and I would be a voice that was needed. And, you know, and, and just, you know, Rep Ty and Rep Entman and, and Senator Randall, I mean, all of the stories that you've heard are stories of non-traditional folks that no one looked at. I mean, none of us were raised to be politicians. I mean, and, and I still, when someone calls me a politician, I have to, you know, I'm like, whoa, wait, oh yeah, all right. You know, cause it's a really, it's not, a, a label in which I'm used to. And when anyone closes their eyes and sees and hears the word politician, that person doesn't look like the four of us on this call today. And that is what I hope will change, right? I hope that being a politician will look like Rep Entman, Rep Ty, or Rep Senator Randall myself. That's what I'm hoping. And that you do believe in yourself if nobody has asked you, but it is something that you have as a crazy dream in the shower one day that you will then pursue it, whatever that means. And I will tell you back to education. That's what I realized is I needed education. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know anything. And so I went out and got that education. There's all kinds of different ways to get that. I met with folks, I went to training programs, like, you know, you can find the education that you need if you don't have immediate friends or family that can support you in this, that's okay. Uh, not everyone needs to rally around you, but you need to rally around you. And if you know you can make a difference and this is your calling to be of service, regardless of what your family and friends think or, regardless of what other people think, frankly, if this is something that you know that you want to do and you feel strong in your conviction, go for it. And when it gets tough, remember these two words, keep going, just keep going one foot in front of the other. You never know where you're going to end up. I mean, I, I mean, you know, Rep Ty already said she, she never thought she'd be a politician. Right. And I'm, of one of those people that, you know, didn't know that was even an option. And so I just want you to remember those two words, keep going. And it doesn't, you know, apply to just this. It applies to anything that you, you're, whatever your biggest week in grad school, we called them BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. So set one for yourself. And I will say this, if your goal that you set for yourself doesn't scare the living bejesus out of you, it's not big enough. And set a goal that is big enough that scares the living bejesus out of you 
And that's what you go for. And you don't just get there from today. You get there little steps every single day towards your mission, towards your vision, towards your own purpose. And if you get knocked off the way, that's okay. Every day, every day that you wake up and open your eyes is a new day to literally get back on track to your vision. Uh, because the day that I said, you know, I had this crazy thought in the shower to be a senator to the day I was sworn in as a senator, I'm going to tell you there was a lot of different paths along the way. There was a marriage in there. There was a divorce in there. There was grad school in there. There was not believing that I could do it in there. There was all kinds of things in there. And that's okay, right? But if you keep that crazy vision in your mind, and, and I'm going to tell you two things that are really helpful. One, write it down. And two, tell somebody. Because when you keep it in your own mind, it's really scary. But when you tell somebody, and maybe two or three somebodies, it becomes very much a possibility. And I'll tell you another thing about Americans. Americans are helpful people and they like to help. We like to help people. And if you tell somebody your big crazy dream, and maybe you tell 10 people, one of those people is going to have a great idea that you would have never thought of to get to your next step. So I encourage you two things. If you remember anything, it's dream big, tell somebody out loud, believe in yourself and keep going. We believe in you and we need you. Wow. So much. Thank you so much. Who else is taking notes? <laughs> A lot of notes. Thank you so much for that last round. Um, Dr. Tata Runga, does this resonate for you at all, oh being goodness. a woman of color in leadership? <laughs> I am in overwhelm. This is just amazing. This is, this is food for life, not just for how to become a politician. And so this is so important that we listen to you. I just, I'm so excited. You know, I think uh, Dean Coley, it's time for us to go to some questions in the chat. Yeah. Please um, um, go ahead and take a few minutes. We have yeah. a lot of audience still with us, which is wonderful. Um, go ahead and put your questions uh, in the Q and A and we will sift through those. Um, but yeah, I just want to express uh, my own gratitude for you all speaking about your paths as women of color and leadership. And I, I'm feel, I feel a lot of resonance. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of models. And what you're doing right now is modeling um, yeah. to a lot of other women of color. Um, and so that, that resonates with my journey as well. So just deep, deep gratitude. You know, not only that, uh, Dean Coley, but we didn't even know that we needed you to be our models. Right. Um, and so it's so beautiful. And we're adults. Yes. We're adults. So <laughs> I, I can only imagine what the young people would be thinking, how they would be inspired to shape their lives by hearing from you. This is so, so powerful. One of the questions that's already come to the, pat, uh, to the chat, and this is from our own Anya Robertson. I think she's an aspiring lawyer, so she might one day be in the state legislature. She asked, "Do you can you give any insights on uh, being in legislative spaces while being a woman of color? What is that like?" You can answer as you feel compelled. Well, I think that um, this is Representative Intiman. So. This was being in the legislator as a legislator was not my first round of um, being in Olympia. I took advantage of an opportunity to be a session aide after when I was in my last year of college. Now that was very interesting because they kept on telling me I had to move to Olympia and I had to rent a room and I was supposed to share it with other people. And I was like, look, I'm a grown woman. I know how to get up and get to work every day. I can drive to Olympia every day and be on time. That will not be a problem for me. So I went there and again, being that I was a non-traditional student, I was a non-traditional session aide. 
my experience in Olympia was very interesting. Uh, I was often asked if I work there, where I worked, was I supposed to be in that part of the building? Um, I was once <laughs> waiting for the shuttle to take me to the parking garage and the shuttle driver said, well, this parking, this shuttle is for employees who are trying to get to the parking garage. I said, yes, I know. That's why I'm standing here. Um, things have changed in the legislature. You have to find your support where you can. Um, when, when I first came, there were five of us who created a black member caucus. Now we have 10 and it is by Cameron. And we are, we are a support for each other. We don't always have the same ideas or want to support the same legislation, but it's nice to know that we have a black member caucus and a member of color caucus where people can just go to decompress and to, you know, just be honest about what is happening um, in the day. Days are not always easy. The COVID has brought us to a remote session, but we passed some of the most, I think, important pieces of legislation around re police reform. It was not easy to do. I know personally, it took its toll on me physically and emotionally. And um, there were times when I ended this session not wanting to come back to Olympia. I was just done. Um, I had thought that I had given all that I could and my family and my health were more important than anything. But after I took a little bit of a break, I learned that um, it is bigger than me and um, I have a responsibility. Um, and I come from a faith tradition that says to those who much is given, much is expected and uh, I can't quit. So I can rest and that is what I did. And now I am back and so those are the things that I would want you to know. It is not easy, but I have often been the only black person in the room. I came from 12 years of working for a member of Congress and that gave me the opportunity to be in many spaces where I was the only black person in the room um, and people would say and do things um, almost as if I was not there or I was not a person. It was an eye-opening experience. And so it taught me that I am in these spaces and places for a reason. And even when it seems like there is nothing for me to learn here, there is always something for me to learn. And there is always something for you to learn whether it is through success or through trying again, um, there is always something for you to learn. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have another question, a couple more questions. Um, there's a question from an Evergreen senior, Jamie Hunt. Are there any times you feel intimidated for speaking the truth about a matter? If so, how do you handle those pressures? And that's open for anyone. Deborah, is it okay? <laughs> oh, this is a very lovely question. Uh, no. <laughs> that's the answer. Um, I, I think going upstream, right? Um, like uh, Senator Das has mentioned, um, I think. I think, I think I can speak for myself. My strength is in my vulnerability. My strength is being willing to, to show that I will cry when I need to. I, I will scream when I need to. And when I scream, you better listen. Um, I... I did not come to legislature to benefit myself. The intimidation, if there were, and there were plenty actually, 
um, didn't phase me because I knew I was there with this gigantic, a lot of community behind me. I was never there alone. I mean, there's time when you feel, <sighs> where are my people? Can they just like appear magically so I can see them instead of just like, you know, spiritually believe that they behind us? You know, there's that time. But when things get hard, that the, I would like Representative Entman talked about her faith. When it's hard, it's the spirit that guide me, the spirit that we are in this together. Um, so no, um, it doesn't mean that it wasn't it wasn't um, hard. And and I think I spoke to that to like how do you, how did I handle um, that space is because. I believe I wasn't, I, I, I mean, if honestly, you guys, if it's left to me and I didn't meet amazing people, I didn't hear incredible stories of courage. Um, I didn't cry so many, 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 many times over and over and over. I didn't live the experience of a refugee. I didn't so deeply believe in the democratic system. I, I, I did not, love this country and its people enough, I would not, I would not volunteer myself to serve as a politician. I will not. <laughs> no amount of money can, can, can make me do these things. And so once again, um, nobody can intimidate us. We are strong women. Senator Das, did you have something to add? Yeah, I'll I'll just say that um, these these spaces, these legislative halls with their marble and their pomp and circumstance, they weren't created for us, right? They weren't created for people that look like me. And so, when you do come into these spaces, um you are challenging the status quo just by being there, just by the nature of you being there. There's only 49 senators and 98 house reps and one governor and that's it, right? So there, that's the number of people and it's just the 98 uh, reps and 49 senators that create laws for our state. And the governor's only option is to veto or not, sign or veto, that's it. So that's what you're talking about and that is, a very small number of people at any given time that have the power to create a law. You know, I have I have nephews that are eight, eight today, actually his eighth birthday is say eight and, and five. And if you ask them what I do, they say, my auntie makes laws, right? And it's kind of one of those really surreal things when they say it out loud that what what that power is and what a responsibility that is too and i will say you know i felt it a lot less when we were at home last year um because you know we were in our own homes doing session but the the previous two years in olympia i mean it is it is blatantly obvious that these spaces were not created for us um, and I will share that I did say something very publicly that um, ended up in uh, very, very uh, public way. And, and this was before the mur murder of George Floyd and after, you know, when folks had some sort of reckoning and some sort of awakening, um, my comments were that uh, people apologized to me after that because they realized what I was talking about, which is, um, institutional and inherent bias that is in every legislative body. It's in every government body. It's in every school system. It's in every, it's baked in. I mean, it's literally baked in because the people who created the laws uh, that we know and have come to abide by weren't created for us and they weren't created by us. And in order to change that, it's going to take everyone and a lot of more awakening, and it's going to take more people standing up. 
And speaking truth to power, even when you're a senator, is really hard. And when I spoke truth to power, it was extreme. I've never been so alone in my entire life. It was lonely. And I stood, the, you know, the eight Associated Press um, asked me, do I regret my comments? And I said, no, I don't regret my comments because it started a conversation. Now we have diversity and equity training in our caucuses. You know, we, we are, people are more realize what that meant and what, what my comments were. And so I just, I, d I have no regrets because it, it needed to be said. And um, apparently I was the one to say it that day. And <laughs> um, so, you know, someone asked about speaking truth to power and I will say, you know, I, there's a, there's a meme that I love, which is stand in your truth, speak your truth, speak, uh, speak even when your voice is shaking. And even when, especially when your voice is shaking, that is when you are in your power. And that is when you need to speak up even louder. And it might take the world a couple of years to catch up with you, but you will at least feel, I, I will tell you when I spoke my words and felt my truth, um, it was, A cathartic moment for me um, to share what I had learned and when I was asked what what it was like to really be in the legislature. So, speak up. We need you. Indeed, it feels like today is a lot about voice, you know, and and speaking up and how do we begin to do that and how do we entrust those who are speaking up on our behalf. Um, there's another question here about what advice you uh, and encouragement to students would de uh, who desire public office on this level would you offer? I'll say get involved in your community. Um, there are local what's called legislative districts and they have monthly meetings. Um, that is a place to go. There's a lot of indivisible groups. That's a great place to go, get active politically. Um, just make sure you are um, in spaces where people are having these conversations and start talking to folks. And something I mentioned earlier, just share your desire to wanting to do this and look for opportunities um, to advance your knowledge and your um network and your community of folks that will support you. Yes, beautiful. Add Thank to you. this, okay. may I add to this really quickly too. Um, and again, it's not, it's not about challenge, it's more opportunity, um, especially uh, for whichever legislative district that Senator Das uh, encourage you and whether it's Democrat or Republican, I have no idea who is, uh, a political capacity in the audience, but whichever uh, party you choose to uh, participate, even Green Party, um, Liberty Party, and all of those party, um, as a woman of color, and I think there was that one question about being a woman of color in these political space, just mm. know you will not be welcome. Mm. Just oh. know that uh, your voice will be kind of like put down. Just know that the system, once again, even though you think those are your people, <laughs> just know <laughs> that they will challenge you. And like Senator Das say, keep going because you are the change that needed. So don't think that it only happened in the Hall of Olympia. It's everywhere. That's why we call it institutionalized and systemic, right? Um, just know that. No, oh, that's so powerful. Preparing for the reality. Um, and what you said, Senator Das, about courage, what you said rang true for me, that courage is not about the absence of fear or something it's you go forward I think that's a saying I don't know who said it but you go forward um in spite of the fear and that is the courage 
and that um, Representative Tai, um, knowing that you're going what you're going to be up against, so that you can prepare for that. That's just such a gift. Um, and not to expect off. to be welcomed. Wow, what a reality! Thank you. Gosh, did um, Representative Entman? Did you get to answer to that? You already got to answer. All representatives answered that question. Did they? Okay. Let's try one more question, Dean. Sounds great. Would you like to ask another question? I, I see one more here um, from one of our faculty members. Um, thanking you for speaking with us today. Um, are there places and times when women of color elected officials across the state and across offices gather to support and mentor one another? Um, and then there's an extension of, if we were to offer that at Evergreen, would you be interested? <laughs> so what kinds of gathering spaces do you all have? It sounds like you have a squad here. And also, is, is it something you've created yourselves? Is there something, yeah, tell us about that. You know, I, I, I will tell you that I actually teach a class at Yale and I teach another class at um, University of Texas. Um, so happy to chat. And I was just going to say our, the work that I do and the groups that I am a part of are the Black Member Caucus, Member of Color Caucus. Um, where we meet and how we get together in Washington State during session is a very interesting thing. So we always have to be cognizant of making a quorum and all of those things and, and the Open Public Meetings Act, which uh, sometimes we are also subject to. Um, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to be on your campus. I find it a beautiful, a beautiful place to visit um, both the Olympia campus and then I have spoke at the Lyceum at the Tacoma campus years ago when um, Dr. R.T. Yes, Young. Young was there. That was that was many years ago, but I'll never forget that. But I appreciate the opportunity. I think for me, you know, I have a Black women's book group, and um, I don't know if this is like it is for everybody else. We always pick a book. We never talk about the book when we are meeting together. We eat food. We talk about our family. We decompress. And so my Black women's book group has become my support group for session. And they once stayed on and watched the legislative process for five hours when we were debating a piece of legislation that allowed us to put to, allowed a piece of, uh, allowed us to create an independent investigations when police use deadly force. So my friends who did not have to be on Zoom for six hours, participated by watching and commenting and making public comment. Um, and that was, that has been one of the most awesome experiences that I ever had because they were also texting me and chatting with me while I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> but it was, it was a, a real life experience and I'll never forget it. And, and that is where uh, I find my support. But I have to say the Member of Color Caucus and the Black Member Caucus are also very supportive places for me as well. And isn't that the true meaning of democracy? When you've got your friends calling you about and listening to that legislation. Um, and, you know, I just have to say, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when we might have had one person of color in the whole legislature, today you have changed the entire tone with your presence. Uh, but the fact that you are there, even if your girlfriends can call in or zoom in to the, the state uh, proceedings, how blessed are we as a state to have access in that way? Yeah. So just so wonderful. It does bring to me um, kind of a question we skipped over, Dean Coley. It comes to about mentorship and just thinking about, 
you know, you all speak with such passion and, and I've seen the confidence, that personal confidence really, really matters in this game. Um, and then I have seen also where you have spoken about standing alone and, 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 and just using your voice and, and even the shaky voice, you've talked about that. Um, there must be someone, and maybe not, so please tell us, if you have had mentors, if you have been, if there are people you look to who have given you the road to follow so that you might um, that you might go to where you have reached so far. So my leadership mentors and models came from my church family. So I have Mrs. Frances Carr. Mm -hmm. I have Mrs. Dorothy Johnson. I have my godmother, Mrs. Gertrude Fields. And then, as you know, Marsha, my mother and my grandmother were forces in the community. Um, I try to, I have tried to create an informal mentorship program. If people, if young people want to reach out to me, I will uh, have a conversation, usually take you to coffee or take you to lunch, talk about what it really is to run for office. I don't charge any fee for that. I have talked to some people once or twice. I have other people who we have, we're in our third year of a once a month informal mentoring relationship um, who I fully expect to either run for office or to do other things in leadership in the community because leadership isn't just in the legislative body. You know, I have helped people prepare to be in the C-suite, to be in, um, to be in leadership in, in some of the private industry that also has a very large impact um, women and people in the African-American community. We have a number of tech organizations that really need to look at their leadership, but we also need to help people prepare for what it's like to be in those boardrooms. And you can take board training, but if you've never experienced being in a boardroom, and uh, what all of that entails, sometimes it is helpful to have uh, folks who have had that experience as well. So that is what I do. I mean, I, I, my husband says, please stop giving out your phone number. I give out my phone number. It has never, it has never hurt me. I just wanna say, people have not taken advantage. People, like I said, some people will call me once and there are other people who I've had ongoing relationships with, but I don't mind speaking with anyone who is interested in public service. I think it is an honor and a privilege to serve. And whether that means you are an elected official or you work at the post office, because we know there is power in working at the post office. As many of our aunts and uncles with their PhDs, it was the only place that they were able to work after they had graduated from higher ed. So there is no shame in being at working at the post office or being an elected official. Wherever you are in public service, and there are many places for you to be, the Department of Ag, the Department of Ecology are also places for African-American people. And this is my, my favorite place is the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. I just want you to know it is a sacred place for me and being in public service and having the opportunity to go into the Library of Congress and go into the reading rooms um, has just, is, there is no greater honor. It is a very sacred space. Those are all places of public service that you could, should think about. I'd be happy to talk to anybody about a life of public service. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm kind of plus one for everything Deborah has shared. Um, for me, it's really uh, my grandparents who raised me, who fought so that I could attend school um, at earlier age. Uh, yeah, she, my grandparents grew up during the wartime in Vietnam, as many of you know, um, so they didn't have a chance to attend school at all. They were not able to read or write. And so my mother form of advocacy was to cook. 
So she would cook and she would invite people over to her dinner table and then she would chew their ears out, like how my grandchild should attend school. Uh, <laughs> so uh, they, they mentor me in that sense. I get to watch them um, doing um, advocacy and lead in the space that they can, um, in whichever tools that they have. Um, I too, my representative Entermend, um, in my uh, local school district, um, our high school students who are interested in involved and engage in policy, uh, they would form groups, they would follow a particular legislation, they would attempt to learn how to write legislations, I would help uh, convene stakeholders or inviting people so that they can have conversation and learn, like Representative Entman mentions, like you don't know what sitting in the boardroom look like until you're sitting in the boardroom and until you ask the questions and people tell you, no, that's not possible because that is how it triggered them to dig deeper, to, to research further, to figure out how to solve problem. And um, like Rep Entman, I, um, I believe that, here's a, here's a funny story. I was asked to run for, for a Senate seat. And one of the, uh, one of the asks was, um, if you can raise half a million dollars in six weeks, the rest we will take care of. And I asked uh, the individual, I was like, and you told me you vetted me. And they say, yes, your name was on top of every list. And so that's why we're here having conversation with you. And I say, no, you did not vet me. I'm a refugee. I can call every, every uncle and aunts and families and friends and there's no way in the world that a refugee can raise half a, million, half a million dollars in six weeks. So first of all, you are wrong. Second of all, you do not deserve me. And since you didn't do your homework right, and if you think I'm that leader you seek, you don't ask that. So um, I too believe of helping and lifting people of color and community where there's no voice for them. And I wanted to prepare the next generation as much as I can. Um, yes, and I'm with Rep Entman. I have not. Uh, ever feel bad about giving out my personal phone number to anyone. Senator Das, would you like to say something as we wrap up? Sure, I think um, seeking mentors and both, you know, in a formal mentor relationship or just um, following the, their lead. You know, I, I definitely see folks as mentors that I've never talked to, right? And so um, one way that I've found, um, I do this thing when I'm in the middle of a transition or I wanna make a change or wanna try something new, I do what I call 50 coffees. And I try to have 50 coffees with 50 different people. Um, most people, when you ask them for an informational interview, will say yes, they like to, you know, if you say something like, can I pick your brain? Um, most people will say yes to a half hour, you know, coffee, especially now in Zoom land, where we can just do these types of things over Zoom. Um, and, you know, you can even say, I'm doing this thing called 50 coffees and I had you on my list of somebody that I wanted to talk to. That's really flattering for somebody. Uh, to know that you're on some kind of list, you know, and so that's, that's one way that I do um, do that. And I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a formal mentorship. It might, you know, might evolve into that, but uh, just reaching out and saying, you know, I met you through this or so-and-so recommended you. And at the end of the coffee, you should always leave with Based on what we just talked about, who else from your network do you think I should meet? And then ask them to do an introduction. If they you know, say, oh, you should meet so-and-so and such-and-such, then leave with, if I send you 
a summary of you know what I'm after. Like you got to make it easy for the busy person, right? So uh, email your email them a paragraph of, of about you or why you want to meet the person that they recommended, so they can literally just forward it on and copy you. So make it as easy as possible for somebody to make an introduction for you. Uh, folks who are extremely busy don't have time to craft emails like that, but if you make it easy for them and they can just hit forward and copy you on it and they've done what they needed to do, um, I think that's a really easy way to uh, meet folks that are outside of your network that you already have and you know, folks that might be interested in helping you. And you never know what that will spark, right? What, what career path that might take you down or who you might be introduced to. So that's my, that's what I do. Thank you. Um, and I just, I am full right now. I think we have reached kind of the end here, Dean Coley. And I just have to say, I am truly full. I feel fed the best nourishment through this, not just talking about the legislature, but we're talking about life decisions today, aren't we? Yes, yes, we are. And thank you so much for sharing your personal stories with us. So generous. I'm full as well. And I I'm, can't wait to reflect on what I've learned here today. So we just want to thank you, state leaders, our state leaders. Thank you so much. We want to take this opportunity to thank you for your contribution to just the tremendous progress you've made for our state, for all of us. And your time in office has been truly a marker of what is possible in when equity is at the forefront. I mean, just think about the conversations that are happening right now in our state, state legislature because of you. So you're changing the game. We're just so proud of you. And also we see that equity is about improving our humanity. It's not just about how many people we're hiring, who's been elected. I mean, today we see you, maybe half a dozen, um, Dr. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Entman will be doctor later, um, talks about, you know, the, the Black caucus. That wasn't possible a decade ago, and now it is. And I, I, just, I just feel like um, we have really, we, we've said state, representatives, but I think that you all have really shown what it is to grow character, what it is to be determined, you know, and I, and, and as I heard you speak, I think it was, it might've been the Senator who talked about um, advice to plant a seed. I'm saying plant a seed, but you just gave advice, two things. You said, I wrote it down. You said, write it down. <laughs> and you said, tell somebody. And how powerful that can be. I mean, the wisdom you have shared with us today, all of you. Um, Deborah, I was so honored to know your family, even watch you grow up. And I'm just so proud to call you my state legislator, um, to think of your grandmother who you mentioned today. I was honored to know her. Dr. Tai, thank you so much. I, everybody's a doctor today, I'm so sorry. <laughs> But it. thank you so much uh, for that bravery, you know, coming as a refugee. I mean, you just make it sound so sexy. Your life has been so important, so important. I mean, you could be wallowing somewhere in the challenges and yet you use them all to stand on and you stand so tall. Representative, no, Senator Das. We are just so happy to hear from you today and what you have shared, such wisdom you have given to all of us. And I can say to all of you, including our representative Randall, who's not with us today, please let us know you have done your families proud. You have done your community proud. And we are just so, so inspired by your messages today. So with that, we'll say thank you Dean Coley, it has been a pleasure How being fun. A I just, yeah. we're so full. Yes. So thank you for being here, everyone in the audience, mm -hmm. our community members, and thank you to the legislators for joining us. I guess we'll plan number three next. <laughs>
Yes. <laughs> next time in Tacoma. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye.